So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Demers. I'm the TV Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow at the Power Plant. I'm here to introduce today's field trip conversation between Althea Thauberger and Carrie Tribe. Uh, field Trip is an online platform that delivers arts experiences with some of Canada's most celebrated artists in a national partnership with leading arts organizations. From children's programs to artist talks and workshops, these activities include a range of subjects that engage communities and support artists. To access the content, please visit fieldtrip.art. Today, we'll hear from two artists who have been long-term friends and collaborators. There will be opportunities for questions at the end of the program, so please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, now let me introduce our speakers briefly. Althea Thauberger is an artist, filmmaker, and educator contributing to experimental practices in social documentary. Her projects are produced in site-responsive processes and involve collaborative research and production. The final works, films, videos, performances, audio recordings, and photographs are reflections on local histories and sociopolitical power dynamics, including ones involved in the production process itself. Over the last two years, Thauberger has presented solo exhibitions at the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver, the Art Gallery in Southern Alberta in Lethbridge, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia in Halifax, and the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. Carrie Tribe is an artist and filmmaker based in Los Angeles. Her work has been the subject of solo presentation at SF MoMA in San Francisco, the High Line in New York, Carpenter Center for Visual Arts in Cambridge, the Power Plant in Toronto, Modern Art Oxford and Camden Art Center in London. Tribe's work is in the public collections of MoMA, the Whitney, the Hammer Museum, among other institutions. She received her MFA from UCLA attended the Whitney Independent Study Program and received a BA from Brown University. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Laura, um, uh, for the introduction and for all the behind the scenes work. Um, I wanna thank also everyone at the power plant for making this possible. It's really wonderful to, um, uh, to have this opportunity to join this program. Um, uh, in, uh, in some proximity to the work that's being done at the power plant, which is just, uh, I think, some of the most uh, important and powerful programming that's happening in, in Canada at this time. So I'm really honored to be here um, and delighted to be here with my dear friend, Carrie Tribe. Uh, I'm coming, I'm now in Vancouver in my home, uh, which is unceded Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh territory. Um, and it's a beautiful morning here, the sun is shining and um, uh, it's very bright and the, the, the leaves are falling. So it's just a really, it's a nice moment to be with you. Um, and, uh, and to have an opportunity to share, uh, to share about a kind of long-term uh, friendship and, uh, and, and series of works that Carrie Tribe and I have, um, have uh, undertaken together and, uh, and separately. Uh, and to kind of like, I think, you know, to a certain extent, continue a conversation that began how many years ago, 16, 17 years ago when we first met in Florida. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to do to start is to let you know, this is going to be a, a fairly informal conversation. We are going to share um, images and video clips from projects that we have worked on together. Um, and we wanna start the conversation with the time that we met. Um, and so that was in 2003, the spring of 2003 uh, at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. And uh, that was uh, near New Smyrna Beach um, on the east side of uh, Florida. And um, it was a really kind of wonderful uh, residency opportunity that brought together a number of visual artists who, uh, who had responded to a call to work with master artist Jillian Waring, uh, as well as a group of young poets who were there at the same time. And, uh, um, that was when I first met Carrie, and I think in many ways she and I were in sort of similar moments in our lives, but also very different moments in our lives. We had both just graduated um, from our MFAs, uh, me at the University of Victoria and Carrie at UCLA, um, and, we're, and I think both of us had just completed uh, projects, uh, film-based projects that 
um, had been the, the, our kind of first major works that got exhibited and that got kind of uh, spoken about in um, art uh, discourses. And we were both kind of like trying to figure out what to do next um, and taking this opportunity to be uh, amongst other artists. And this, this, this was the moment that we met. And so um, I guess uh, we're going to look at a couple photographs from that residency. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for driving this, Carrie. <laughs> Thank yeah, you for I, I, I'll just say a quick, I, I'm, I love, I'm happy to have you um, sort of maybe take the lead in walking us through this. And I'll just say a quick hello to everybody. And um, I know a number of people will see this later, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that our several of our dear friends and old friends are also uh, and collaborators are, are tuning in live. So I'm very grateful uh, to the power plant and Laura um, and to you, Althea, for inviting me to do this. And just to say again, this will be uh, quite informal and um, and there's a, about 100,000 technical things that are gonna go wrong. So we're just gonna do our best through it. So Althea, I thought maybe if you wanna keep talking about the kind of synergy that happened right away when we first met, because I think it was, I think as soon as Althea and I saw one another's work in the very first day when Jillian asked each of us, this is Jillian here on the left, um, asked each of us to present something we'd recently made. I think my sense is that we kind of looked across the room at each other and said, oh, you, you exist? I want to get to know you. And so I thought maybe if I, did you give me a picture of Songstress to bring up or should I? I tried, but it didn't work. That was okay, one of the- We don't have Songstress. I, I showed um, that very first day, a clip of Here and Elsewhere that I'd made. Um, this is a picture from my, my thesis project at UCLA from 2002. Um, and I'd been tempted to show a little clip of this work, but I, I think we should, Kind of just keep walking through it. So I'd made, um, I'd made a two-channel installation that was my first attempt to kind of think structurally about film and how um, how one might consider the experience of the viewer in a spatial relationship to the thing that they're looking at um, as a kind of structural and metaphorical template for how a piece would get made. And that sounds kind of abstract, but I think as we go on, we'll we'll start to kind of get there. And I didn't, I'd never worked with a crew and I didn't, I had to kind of serve as a director on this project, which is an uncomfortable position for me. Um, and then over the subsequent years following this, when I knew Althea, I realized today that actually, Althea, your work is the only project, you're, you're the only person whose films I've ever like been on set. While they're, you're the only person I've ever seen direct. So I, I'm like making it up as I go along, but then I have this other model that's also not a traditional normal filmy directing model, um, but that's been really important to me. So I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that, but I just wanted to frame, frame it with the work that we had kind of made and we're starting, like we both had this funny moment when people were starting to pay attention to us. And then we were at these places in our lives in 2003 where um, I was going through um, a death in the family and a big life transition where I was in the process of trying to buy a house with my soon to be husband. Um, and just very, it was like a funny free floating time in Florida when we were together. I don't know if you wanna speak about where you were at at that point. I was going through a divorce. Um, and, you and knew, I think you knew you were gonna go through a divorce. I don't know if you were quite in it yet, but you knew. <laughs> and, um, and so I was, uh, you know, also in this kind of limbo, I was, I was very distraught. Um, and Carrie, you, I don't know if you remember that time, but I remember, um, uh, the, the, the many kind of conversations that we had about my circumstance as well and how incredibly supportive you were. And that support really felt like, I think at the, at the, at the very beginning of our very first conversations when we looked at each other's work and we recognized something in each other's work that I think had to do with, I mean, we were, we were both working in film. Uh, we were both working in a kind, with a kind of documentary approach. Um, and both of our films were uh, concerned with the subjectivity of young women. Yes. Um, and, um, and what I really, uh, what I really, uh, I think, recognized immediately and appreciated in her work was an incredible sensitivity and empathy towards uh, your subject, and this uh, remarkable kind of. I mean, you you describe it as something that that you you might not have been super cognizant of, but for me, I recognize this very um, sophisticated and kind of clear uh, structural clarity in how you were thinking about, you must have been thinking about while you were shooting, um, how, the, how the, the decisions that you were making um, in camera um, with the framing and uh, just with all of the kind of the processes of that work and how it was then going to finally be realized in a two channel installation. 
um, and sort of thinking about all of the kind of conceptual and structural uh, mappings that were going on with that. I just found that to be really inspiring uh, and something that I see in your work and that I think that has really influenced me and benefited me from having your presence and input and um, direction um, <clears throat> alongside the, the some of the, the productions that you've been that you've helped me with over the years. So I, wanted, I just wanted to, re to recognize that as something that, that, that I saw in your work right away. And maybe just to, um, for because I know we'll just keep talking to each other about the memory. So maybe I will just show one minute clip from this piece Perfect. that I made in graduate school. This is here and elsewhere from 2002 and um, a two channel large scale installation. Um, and this is just like a minute from the piece. Give me a sign if you don't hear the sound. Do you remember last time when we talked about existing and existence? Have you thought about it since then? No. But you're sure you have an existence? <laughs> yeah. Just one, not several? Yes. Does your existence depend on your body? Yes. So if you only have one physical body, then you only really exist once. Yes. But is your body changing all the time? Yes. If it's changing, does that mean there's an old you and a new you? I guess so. How can you be the same you? Is it just an idea? You said ideas exist. Um. I think I'm still the same me, but I, I am I'm different, but I'm still me. Oops, so that gives you a sense of that. And then Althea produced a photograph while we were there. Do um, you want to talk about this at all? Yes, this was um, uh, a photographic work that was shot with uh, together with Carrie and I and three other women who were in residence at the time. Um, what you see are two rental cars <laughs> that, were, that were rented. I think one of them was yours, Carrie. Um, I think the red one was mine. I think we a few of us went in on that one. And the other one, exactly. And the other one, I think, was Catherine Ross, who was there at the time as well. Right. And, um, and so you see, uh, you see us in the landscape. Um, and uh, there was, the, the work is called Sirius. Um, and, um, <sighs> this is what I came out of the, the, the residency with this, with this single work, with this single image. Um, and I'm not going to say any more about it. It's a, probably enough. And I'm sure enough. My, I mean, if my children ever tune into this, they'll be embarrassed enough. So maybe we'll, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> but it is, but it, I mean, I, I, I have a, a small print of this on the bedroom wall. And just to say that this is for me really a reminder of, um, I don't know, another world and another time. And looking back at preparing this, I realized that, um, and I don't know, you know how old most of our li listeners will be, but um, I don't think I could have imagined, like like watching Here and Elsewhere, that's a little 10-year-old girl. Um, and I made that piece when I was like 27 or 28. And, um, and now I have a 10-year-old son myself, and he's my second kid. And Althea's been there, you know, through the sort of raising of both of them. And it's really remarkable to look back at this work in the way that, you know, the work stays the same. I mean, it changes in context, but it's quite once in a while I'm really struck by the way these documents you don't always know what you're making and then you look back later and you're like wow that was a moment and that will never to me I feel like this moment will never could never come again but I do before we move on from Florida I want to give a, um, a little shout out to the Atlantic Center for the Arts which still runs an incredible residency um, I, a lot of people have gone through it and um, it's I mean it was just so profoundly important to me and and that time together so I'm very grateful. There are not a lot of residencies in the US. And I don't know if that one's still free, but um, but it was a really, really invaluable time to, to get away before sort of life took over. Um, why don't we move on and talk about this work, A Memory okay, Last Forever? I want to talk about it very briefly, but I think the really important thing about it um, was this, this was really um, uh, the first time that you and I came together to work on a project that was really intentionally uh, that way. I mean, we, we helped each other on our work when we were in Florida, um, but um, this, this is a work that was made in 2004. The title is A Memory Lasts Forever. Um, and it was made in collaboration with these four young women who are um, uh, singers and actors. 
and um, they, they reenact a story about the death of a dog. And uh, it was shot in, uh, on the North Shore of Vancouver. And Carrie came to work on this project as assistant director and really, um, really was a, um, oh, I see, uh, really, really was a, a, an important figure in terms of oh, just helping me figure out how to do that. Like I'd never worked with a large crew in that way before. There were, there were a lot of logistical issues. And there was also just a lot of things that you have to hold in mind. Um, as a director of, of, a, of a work like this um, with uh, a, a quite short production period and sort of thinking about all of the shots that you need. It was a three camera shoot. It was all shot in real time and uh, a shot as, as a kind of stage production, but in, uh, in this uh, suburban yard and pool. Uh, so there's that shot. And I think there might be a couple Next of one, shots. Yes. From, and so this is, uh, this is a, a, a shot of the driveway of this home. Yeah. Um, that we, um, the, at the, the Beckerman's home, actually some people in Vancouver might recognize it, um, that was generously um, loaned to us from them and um, uh, recording a, a musical piece in the driveway. And then um, Carrie- I'll be able to sing where she doesn't celebrate her birthday, which I think it has to do with um, your religious upbringing, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and I couldn't understand, so I figured out, first of all, somebody that we met, Nick Modry at the Atlantic Center. Okay, we can't, we no, no birthday stuff, no birthday okay, stuff. All right, all right, all right. Anyway, yeah, so we surprised Althea with happy birthday, yada, yada. And okay. so, uh, yeah, and, uh, but anyways, uh, you can see how much we love each other. <laughs> um, what are we at, where are we next? Northern, our time? Okay, now we're going to, now we're going to Alberta. Okay, great. So this is a movie file. Hopefully this will open. Do you want, should we start with a little clip from, do you want to show Northern and then show the behind the scenes? Okay, so let's just, um, uh, sure, you want to show Northern and just fast forward to, oh, this is a short clip, is it? It is, okay. One minute, 15 seconds, yeah? Should I play it? So let's play this and then afterwards I'll talk about the work. Okay, and I will see if I can make it full screen while it's Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. So uh, this is a film uh, that was made in the summer of 2005 in Kananaskis country, Alberta. Uh, and it was, uh, it was made with a group of tree planters who were working um, in that area at the time and who worked for a company that I myself had worked for uh, for 10 years. Uh, my whole 20s, I was a tree planter and a foreman for tree planters. And um, this was uh, uh, the, the company that I worked for who were still in a way, uh, sort of like part of it, uh, my extended family to a certain extent because I had spent so much time with them. Um, the summer of 2005, um, Carrie and I went back to, uh, I was working in the tree planting camp and Carrie came and I made this film that was shot on 35 millimeter and transferred to video uh, that was all shot um, in a clear cut where these planters had worked. Um, in a single take uh, using this, um, using this uh, sort of tracking dolly shot and reverse. Uh, and so it was all shot in a single, a single roll of um, 35 millimeter film uh, where the camera uh, sort of um, tracks alongside this bank, turns, uh, views a helicopter coming in landing, uh, a young woman um, uh, in a safety vest coming out of the helicopter and then reviving this group of, um, of um, seemingly unconscious <laughs> Uh, people um, in on, on the bank there, and so um, 
This piece was, uh, again, structurally very challenging to shoot. Uh, what you see in this photograph is Carrie and I um, walking toward the camera in the foreground. And Carrie came to, like I was saying, came to um, Alberta to work on this and to help me, help me plan and direct the film. And we made some other work while we were at it. I think that visit to Alberta occasioned, I don't remember if, wait, I think Mungo was there with us for this yeah. shoot. Um, uh, not for this shoot, he came later, I think. Oh, right, when I shot near Miss or something. Anyway, it's all a blur now, but um, it was a very productive summer of making a lot of work, not the least because the sun didn't set until like three or four in the morning. So you had these incredibly long days to just kind of keep working. <laughs> Um, let's see. Ah, and this is the work that I shot um, in Alberta um, and then completed when we were both living in Berlin afterwards. This is a project called Near Miss. It's an installation view from um, its first exhibition, which was at the Kunstlerhaus Batanien in Berlin, where Althea and I were both in residence. Um, maybe this is the moment to mention that. So I, I, uh, I received this wonderful fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin um, for an academic year. And I moved there with my husband, Mungo Thompson, and we were put up in a fancy apartment on the west side of town um, and subject to brilliant discussions with <laughs> all kinds of intellectuals and public policy experts and wonks. And, um, <laughs> and, and there were some other creative people there, but I definitely felt like I didn't belong. And it was not the experience in Berlin I had um, expected, although it was quite wonderful and stimulating. And then we ended up spending a lot of our time at a very different environment um, in a neighborhood called Kreuzberg, um, near where the wall had been at a storied establishment um, called the Kunstlerhaus Batanien, which still exists, but is no longer a residency. And I found out that I would be uh, given a studio there about a thousand square feet, big open room for the duration of my fellowship. And when Althea said, what are you, you know, what are your plans for the fall? I said, well, I'm, I've got this great residency in Berlin and I'll have this studio. And she said, oh, there's a Canadian artist in residence as well in the, at the Kunstlerhaus Batanien. I should apply for that position and Althea got it. So we spent the next year um, living I basically moved into my studio and Althea lived in her studio and there was a, an artist between us who had to deal with us constantly running back and forth because we basically, you know, created sort of one big, we sort of took over the place um, and, and made quite a bit of work. And anyway, this was a film called Near Miss, an installation um, based around, I think Althea and I were both doing some work around kind of memory and reconstruction and the role of in, the sort of, you know, um, tricky relationship between individual and collective memory. Um, and uh, and I was, um, yeah, I had this idea that it would be interesting to try to remake an, uh, an almost car crash that I'd had many, many years before. And um, and let's see, what pictures do I have? And the easy, I, I tried shooting it in the Sierra Mountains in um, California and um, I got in a little car accident and the film didn't come out and it was a disaster. And then after working with Althea in, in Alberta, I realized that there are actually um, studios and great people there who are able to work. And I had a, now already sort of a community of filmmakers there um, that I knew through Althea. So we shot it there. So this is um, Althea at the wheel of her uh, orange Volvo station wagon on set in my film. Um, the piece went on to show, it was about trying to remake this near miss of an accident. And every time the piece is shown, a different person on crew um, is asked to describe the event that they were participating in remaking. And then that text, their description of the event, ends up in the exhibition in some way. So when the piece showed at Artspeak, um, the text, I'm not remembering who had written this text. This might've been you, Althea. But anyway, the text on the window outside is a, is a version of, in the first person, as though this event had happened to them. So it says something like, I was driving in a snowstorm. It was a long trip, yada, yada, yada. Um, and uh, the piece kind of, you know, every time you see the piece, it'll be a little different because a different person's memory will be uh, included in that. And I have a little excerpt here. Um, yeah, just to sort of see what, see what it turned out to be. So this was shot on 35 millimeter in the back of Althea's car on a stage. The car 
cars up on all four wheels of the car on a dolly on little dollies that we made and then a whole bunch of people um including my dear husband are holding the car and shaking it and then when i yell go they cause a spin out to happen which you'll see momentarily i think i'm spoiling it that's officially a spoiler following the tail lights. Mysterious blank road sign foreshadowing something bad to come. Longer than I remember. Oh no, is the car in front of us skidding out? Oh no, there must be a patch of ice. Wait, what if I hit that patch of ice? Whoa. this in so many years anyway so, so basically the way this piece is it, it, it's called near miss partly because it's a near miss of an accident nothing really happens it's kind of anticlimactic but also because in the way that these that video installations are structured you go in you watch a few minutes it cuts to black and you think oh i've seen it you walk away but no in this case there's actually three different takes of the same event oh, really? um, so this is slightly different. So every if you stay, if you if you happen to notice that the running time of the piece is five and a half minutes, um, and you spend enough time with the installation, you may notice that in fact each iteration is a little bit different. Each time the event is recalled, as it were, something slightly different comes up, um, more or less the same. So it's also about that sort of near miss and recollection that every time we write a memory, every time we repeat a memory or recall a memory, we're also kind of rewriting it. Um, the farther we get, the more we remember, the less accurate the representation we have or the less proximity we have to that original if you if you believe in such a thing you know if if you believe the science that essentially events are encoded um in primarily in the hippocampus of the brain they're encoded often when they're associated with intense emotion if something is very scary um, or traumatic they're often encoded more strongly but then in the recollection of those events um they shift a little bit according to experiences that may be going on during the recollection so that's my little neuroscience spiel about the, the background um, for that project. And uh, you yeah, know, I just so want to say something, Carrie. Like it's interesting yeah. that, um, uh, like I, I, I never really put this together before, but I must have been so influenced by your work in thinking about a memory lasts forever, like, oh. um, like thinking about um, uh, here and elsewhere. Mm. And then this kind of iterative sort of aspect of memory and reenacting something four times over, but in a very different kind of process than yeah. you often work within. Oh yeah. Um, and then the, this kind of title, "Memory Lasts Forever," which of course is is a bit facetious because right. um, you know things shift and change. Um, but then thinking about the way that near miss is is uh, also in some way has a relationship with that kind of um, that those forms of repetition. Uh, so cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's all clear in hindsight. You muddle through it at the time and then you're like, oh yeah, it's so obvious. Okay, um, so you spoke about us um, uh, having this incredible, privileged, wonderful uh, time in Berlin. Uh, that was the, uh, so yes, Carrie, you had told me that it's spring of 2005, that was even before we went to Alberta, I think, that you oh, yeah. had uh, received this uh, fellowship um and i had been aware that uh, the the kenda council uh i i think that that program um is no longer uh with the canada council but at the time there was um, a really wonderful um, residency program that you could apply for as um a visual artist to spend a year at the kunsthospitanien and i applied for it and i was absolutely blown away that it was successful and that i was i had received this grant to go to berlin for a year at the same time as Carrie tribe. <laughs> and so we spent a year together uh, in the same residency program, but you know, funded by different um, agencies. So we had this, we had this really, really special time to basically live and work together for a year. I'm and so glad you have this photograph too, because it really captures um, that that incredible space that we were in, this building that was one wing was occupied by squatters who'd been there for many years. 
another wing was a music or like a, a floor of another wing was a music school. There was a printmaking studio with a, a tremendous archive of old print technologies in the basement, and then two stories of artists and residents, and a very, very grumpy guard that would always somehow like find a way not to let you back in when you were locked out or provide access to the elevator. I remember it was the only thing about it that was a problem. And the fact that the beer was cheaper than the water. There was a, a <laughs> across from our studio, there was a Freiluft Kino and you could go out into the, okay, now I'm, anyway, there was an oh, open air Italy. cinema. Okay, I can't say much about this, but just the amazingness of Berlin on a summer night, you could cross the hall and there was like a room back in the day when you all shared computers, there was a computer room with a vending machine and you could, from the vending machine, get a beer for a Euro or a water for a Euro 20. And you could sit and drink it in the windows and watch this, you know, amazing summer films play on this beautiful outdoor cinema. And that that itself was actually quite influential on a project I made in 2016 that was an outdoor cinema screening that trying in my own mind to recreate something of the magic of that summer in Berlin. Is that but, the um, LA River project? Yeah, but we won't oh, go there. So that way talk about okay. civilians. Okay, so to these, I'll just try to give like the super um, brief elevator version. Um, it was a collaborative project that was made with eight young men who were um, conscientious objectors and who were kind of conscripted to serve in the um, alternative military service. So um, uh, a civilian social service, they worked in hospitals, kindergartens, uh, halfway houses, nursing homes, etc. cetera. Um, and through um, the work of a whole bunch of wonderful people, including Vanessa Olram, uh, we were able to make an agreement with them to allow these uh, eight young men to come and work on the art project as part of their obligatory service for a period of about three months uh, for, uh, for a number of hours over the course of actually more like four months. Um, so we started with workshops, um, developed um, a project together that turned into a kind of performance piece in this space that you see, uh, which, is, which is the former chapel of the Batanian, which used to be a hospital. Um, you see a, a set that's constructed out of a multi-tiered scaffolding uh, construction that was designed in collabor with these um, eight young men in collaboration with uh, a local architect um, and a performance that was enacted within um, that sort of in a way describes their reaction to uh, or describes their uh, a kind of way of translating their experience as um, doing their obligatory, obligatory service um, inside of this German uh, institutional framework. So um, we made this, we, we did a performance and then filmed it uh, in front of the public and made this sort of black and white, um, uh, sort of noirish, if you will, uh, uh, um, video piece that uh, was then exhibited uh, after the fact. So the title of the piece is Zivildienst ungleich Kunstprojekt. Zivildienst uh, does not equal art project. Oh, yeah. Social service does not equal art project is how it's translated. Um, and Carrie was really, uh, you know, worked very closely with me, the young men, uh, most especially during the filming period, um, which was over the course of, I think, five days um, in the space where we um, had to bring in the lights, um, work on like thinking about how to describe this tiered space um, uh, with the camera and um, and uh, sort of really strategically think about, you know, with quite limited resources, how to get all of these, the, all of these shots and, um, um, and uh, actions that uh, were included in the film. Great. Do you have a clip you want me to play from that or no? I, I don't think it's necessary. I feel like maybe several people have seen it. Okay. And um, this, 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 this image describes the work quite well, I think. Good. Um, so when I was in Berlin, that so I, I showed Near Miss, but I also made a piece called Episode. Um, through the American Academy in Berlin, I had the good fortune to be seated next to this woman in the center named Melinda Crane, who was the host of a German and English um, bilingual talk show called Quadriga on the um, cable network Deutsche Welle. And um, I got to talking to M Melinda about my work and I'd, Long story short, she helped me uh, make uh, a kind of knockoff episode of her show to become my show called Episode. And um, so it was structured exactly like an episode of Quadriga, but it never aired on Deutsche Welle, but it used the same crew, the same set, the same structure. Um, and it traced it, again, it had to do with questions about um, sort of you know personal memory and how one 
in fact, I'm just rather than go down the rabbit hole of this work, because it's it's actually I'm finding it challenging to talk about some of this work that's so old for me and doesn't feel so relevant. But I do think it's kind of funny how this piece turned out. So I'm going to just show a really short clip from the beginning of it um, and a couple of pictures of Althea behind the scenes, because as usual, she was there shooting stills, helping me kind of keep my head on straight and um, and often just sound like serving as a sounding board because it's. Um, you know, when you do these projects that have get, like get a lot of people involved in the production, um, there so often I find there isn't actually the necessary time to just like get quiet for a minute and figure out what what it is you're trying to do. Um, there's so many incoming, there's so much incoming information, and it's for me it feels um, like really exhilarating, and I'm always feel so happy and excited to work with people that have all these skills that I don't have, technical skills and performing skills, um, but also really overwhelming. And so in this context, having Althea there was like the sane person. It's like having a part of my mind outside of myself that I could turn to and go, is this okay? Is this right? Is this what I want? Did we get it? You know, what did you see that I didn't see? And I'm also in the piece, which is kind of excruciating for me. So I was like, that's me on the right there. Whoops. Anyway, it's helpful to have um, it's helpful to have someone that you really trust on set there with you. So I'll play just a, just the intro to this piece so you can see how kind of ridiculous it is. <laughs> That's a terrible intro. Sorry. Hello and welcome back. I'm Melinda Crane. Today we're going to be talking about remembering and its corollary, forgetting. Neurologists are only beginning to understand the two as physiological processes. They're topics of perennial interest in film and fiction, and there's no better place to discuss them than here in Germany, where what is or should be remembered has been shaping national identity since World War II. Such national history is, in a sum, the many, many different individual memories taken together. Each of us assumes that he or she will be able to store and retrieve information at a moment's notice. But particular events tend to be remembered differently by various people and at various points in their lives. So how can we ever be sure of what really happened when there is no material evidence nor witnesses to corroborate a particular recollection? Those are some of the questions that we want to discuss today with three individuals, friends, who shared an unusual experience while traveling across the United States 15 years ago. And they are Carrie Tribe. She's a visual artist based normally in Los Angeles, but right now in Berlin. And she's known for elaborate collaborations with experts in various fields. Okay, let's leave and it Jake there. Stefan Enough of that. Um uh, just a couple of behind the scenes pictures. I realized going through these that I have I have this picture in like 10 different versions from 10 different projects of Althea behind the tripod, making, making sure that everything oh, got documented. Out. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Um, uh, sorry. And then um, if I may, so the, the big, th so when I think of this time in Berlin and when I think of Althea's project, Civildienst, I can't help but think of that this was actually the last time in my life when I wasn't a parent. Um, I got pregnant while you were making Civildienst. Um, so if you'll bear with me, this is the next picture I wanted to show. This is um, uh, me and my husband Mungo and our like 12 hour old baby Eno. Um, Althea probably took this picture. I uh, labored at home in this apartment in Berlin and then went to the hospital and had a baby and then couldn't stand the idea of staying in the hospital. and came right back home and Althea was there to meet me. And um, for any parents listening who maybe had the experience of a colicky baby, you will never be as grateful to anyone in your life as the person that takes that baby out of your arms and makes sure that they're off and healthy and eating and sleeping as they need to while you rest a little bit. So that was Althea for us um, for the good first month of, of our son's life. Um, and for me, this was also a time when I uh, couldn't really figure out how you ever make art again when you have a kid, which sounds incredibly entitled and stupid. Um, but also I can still kind of relate to, it just was so, had so taken over my life. And, um, and around the same time we were doing studio visits, um, 
I think I, I think when you know when our son was one day old, we were visited by the curators um, uh, of the Whitney Biennial that year, and um, that was hard to try to kind of get my head around my work. And Mon Mungo had a terrific meeting with them, and um, his work was included in that next Whitney Biennial. Um, but it was I was all over the place, and here was Althea, um, you know, eliciting like the first smiles from our kid and saving our lives. So that was really great. Uh, okay, enough of that. Um, I'm not playing this, right? What a time that was. What a time that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and then this is later. This is like nine months later, maybe a year later. I went to Seattle. I made a piece called um, HM, which would go on to be one of, I think, maybe one of the more important pieces I've made. Uh, and it was a film about a memory impaired man. Um, who only had 20 seconds of working memory, true story. Uh, and the film played through two projectors with a 20 second delay. I didn't include documentation in this presentation, but it involved a fair amount of complicated technical stuff to get the film. Some of it was shot on video, some on film. Long story short, the only lab I could find to produce the, 30, the 16 millimeter transfer from the 35 millimeter blow up or something was in Seattle. But I had this little kid and I couldn't figure out how to make us all work. And so Althea came and met me in Seattle and babysat as she so often did and did the color timing with me. Um, and that's Althea, you can't see it, but she's entertaining my child just off, off frame. Um, and then actually, I think maybe this is a little clip from, from that piece. Maybe oh, I'll just, yay. should I show a little clip? I mean, it feels weird to not yes, talk please. about it. I totally wanna see it, I wanna see it. Okay, so this is um, this is a almost a two minute clip from a 18 minute film installation. Uh, one film playing through two projectors, first on the left, then on the right, with a 20 second delay. We'll watch a minute and 48 seconds. You said something about an operation. Yeah, I said no to myself. I better not be a surgeon. I could make the wrong movements, and the person could be dead, or paralyzed. Okay, Henry. I was thinking about the question and the answer, doubly in a way. What was the question? The well, question of just how things would be or, or could be. And for an understanding, you have to have everything all at once. During the operation, Dr. Scoville made two small holes in HM's skull. Through these holes, he inserted retractors, which he used to lift up the front part of the brain, the frontal lobes. Aspiration requires inserting a small instrument into the intended target and sucking out brain tissue. So Scoville proceeded to remove the hippocampus on both sides, along with cortex surrounding it areas that we know today are critical for the establishment of long-term memory. Henry, what are you describing? A dream you might have. So you weren't remembering anything just now? No, it was like a dream. Like a dream or was it a dream? Well, it was like reality, but still a dream. All right. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> I remember the first time I because the first time I saw this is when we were in that that um, projection theater. Oh yeah. And, and so I saw it for the first time, and I remember I was I was with Eno. I might have been holding him or sitting next to him, but I was just and the both of us were kind of seeing it for the first time, and we were looking at each other like this is amazing. <laughs> and you know, I think we would have been seeing it just on one film too. So we would have That's been right. seeing this other version where, you know, cause typically you're seeing something with 20 seconds later. Yeah. It's, and yeah, it was kind of not until the end that I could figure out what that would be. Uh, what do we have next? Oh, we're up to here. I think that well, can we do already? We're, I think we're, I don't know what else there is, but I just want to, what's that? That's your wedding. Okay. Yeah. This is my, yeah, this is my wedding. Althea again, behind the camera, taking pictures at the wedding. Um, Bless her. Do you want to go to Sis Listers of Earthy? 
Yeah. Okay. Let's do that since we're, since we're almost out of time. And yeah. um, I guess one of the things that I was thinking about when seeing HM just now is again, the, the, how brilliant your work is in terms of just all of the kind of concepts and framings and formal ideas that are kind of like held together um, through, uh, through these like really like seemingly, seemingly um, like, I don't know how you do that. The, the, the structural, the structural kind of um, the, the, the structural elements of the work as as a, a support for all of these um, all of these different kind of dimensions of the work from um, the historical research to the, um, the the different kind of registers that are brought together. So these 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 the the way that you work in this way has been so uh, has been something that I've always been so influenced by, aspired to, but never. I mean, my work is is in a way the opposite. It's always awkward. It's always mucky. It's always kind of like just not at all cool. It's like there's a kind of like uh, not that not not that you know, uh, I, you know, that, but there's there's something that. That I've that, that that you've brought to, and then I would say with this work in particular, that that you came to Vancouver a few years ago to direct because I was in it, <laughs> um, and really and this is out Al this is Althea, um, and this is me trying to look tough, looking tough. Yeah. Uh, so this is a work that was shot on again on the North Shore. Uh, it was commissioned by the Polygon Gallery for their first exhibition in North Vancouver in 2017. Uh, it was shot on a tidal flat uh, in uh, North Vancouver, overlooking the city. And here you see, uh, here you see, it was shot with uh, five, including myself, um, uh, Vancouver women uh, who have kind of lived and worked in the city for some time, um, and who all contributed to uh, the work through um, through. Uh, our presence, our movement, but also I think a certain kind of like I was really thinking about the 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 women who are shown in the work are myself, Kay Higgins, um, Natalie Pershvitz, um, um, Maki Kohara, and um, Sydney Hermont. And um, uh, uh, Natalie Pershvitz uh, designed the 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 costumes in collaboration with each of us, and Sydney Hermont um, created the score. Uh, and some of the kind of historical considerations for the piece were looking at a, um, a film that was also made on the North Shore of Vancouver in the early 1970s, um, uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, which was a frontier drama that um, sort of was really uh, positioning a certain kind of like, in, in a certain kind of moment of um, a kind of back to the land movement and a kind of hippie era sort of fashion and sort of like layering that onto a frontier aesthetic. And of course, in our time, we're thinking about um, uh, thinking about the question of, you know, the kind of settler body in Vancouver, the relationship to the to the land, the polygon gallery being placed on the the the, the shore of this this new institution and the, the shore of North Vancouver. Um, and the, the, the history of also artists presence on the shore um, in, at the Maplewood mud, uh, mud Flats, who also had a relationship with the shooting of McCabe and Mrs. Miller, the Robert Altman film that I mentioned um, in the early 1970s. So uh, there, there are a lot of different kind of considerations, references here. Um, uh, so this was a, a film that was shot on this kind of uh, tidal flat, a, dis a disappearing kind of island um, uh, on the I North I can shore. interject. Thank this is you. where I'm this is where I'm, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. You should keep talking about it. It's great. But this is where this is where I think our strengths complement one another because Althea said, you know, so I'm making this film. Um, and and you told me all this stuff about it, but the last thing you mentioned was that you were shooting it on a tidal flat that was only above water on the day you were able to shoot it for like a sure. couple of hours or something. Right. I mean, it's like they tell you, I hear I never went to film school, like, you know, don't work like working with kids, working with weather working on the water, um, working with animals, like don't do it. And, and they never said like, don't work on a temporary body of land that's only gonna be there for a couple of hours with like lots of inexperience, you know, but it was, that was, it was very intense. Um, and so great to see how you direct because I think from the outside, I mean, I think on paper, it um, makes a lot of sense to talk about you um, embedding in, communities, um, working with people from those communities to develop narratives, using the tools and calling attention to some of the kind of pre-existing 
structural and dynamics, power dynamics. Um, but the piece of it that may not, the p I think what may not be clear to viewers unless they really see a lot of your work is um, the way that you throw yourself into this because, and I've learned a great deal from you on this because I think starting with A Memory Lasts Forever, I, I found that you are able to both um, really earnestly and fully attend to everyone's needs as collaborators and contributors to the project. Everyone has a space to contribute, I think is, is welcome to contribute, but you don't throw yourself under the bus. You are able, I think, to maintain a kind of clarity of vision and know what you want, um, which is a really vital part of directing that I don't know, that, that, I, that I think I've come late to. Um, and for me, as soon as the, as, the pe as people get involved, I start to worry about them. And you're able somehow to maintain. So I, so I'm like, I'll. Um, it's just very hard for me to maintain any sense of vision. I almost like when you're on set, I'm able to kind of outsource it to you and be like, "Is this right? What should I tell them next?" Because as soon as there's something to ask of someone, I have a hard, time, I have a hard time at that point, and then I no longer know what, what, what do I want? What do they want? And you're able to kind of, you saw this project all the way through in a way that even though I was there, um, assisting, directing, I, I. I don't know. You have a kind of clarity of vision that you stay very true to through the work. That um... what I would say is I don't necessarily have a clarity of vision. Like I don't necessarily I don't know what the work is going to be, mm. but there's a kind of and I think it's it's something that that um, has to do with working in this way over the years is that you have a sense of knowing when to trust things. Yeah. Knowing when to be like okay, this 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 is what we should do mm. as opposed to like um, yeah, but. Uh, uh, yeah. And I guess that has to do with, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it does, it certainly does have to do with creating um, a, uh, <clears throat> a sense that um, it's really important to pay attention to everyone and to the kind of contributions and the ideas that come from everyone on set. But you're right, like you, at a certain point, you also have to make decisions. So I'm not really sure. <laughs> But also where right, those lines are, but they exist. That kind of shaggy, there's a kind of shagginess and awkwardness in your work that you mentioned earlier, which I, I see as one of its like great strengths and something I try to take a little bit of in my own. And I think that um, there, that has a relationship to this trust that you're talking about that when, and I saw this in Northern too, and maybe that's because you were a tree planter for so many years and you knew a number of these people and you knew that land and you knew how everything operated. It was like, we're going to set up this situation and what unfolds is going to be captured and it will be enough. There's a kind of um, a kind of trust that you have in that, that, that uh, it just, it, ma it makes the experience of working on these projects really exciting and dynamic because you, I don't know, maybe the worry, just the worry about what it's all going to turn out. Maybe it's the, it's the opposite of a clarity of vision. It's the, it is just the trust in the process actually might be what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm like never as happy or as scared as when I'm, in a position directing a bunch of people for a project of my own. And, um, and I think that the scared part doesn't come up with your work as much. You're kind of like, you're in your element and you just know, and you're just like full steam ahead. So I don't know if that's useful to other people, but it's been very useful to me. And one thing that I wanted to say, uh, maybe as a kind of like last comment was, I was, remi I was reminded in watching um, the clip from Northern um, about how you also have this ability to kind of because you've you've worked you've worked with a lot of I think fairly professional people on set in the past perhaps starting with here and elsewhere I'm not sure because I wasn't around at that time but um, I remember it when we were shooting Northern you told me we need to record the names we need to oh that was smart of me remember that and thank God we did I was like I don't think we need this like we don't need to bring people back and you said to me Althea sit listen <laughs> we need oh, this. Yeah. And you were absolutely correct but no but but that but that that what that's you've done that with every single project of mine where you've sort of like had a the, the kind of clarity beforehand to kind of realize what we were missing actually oh, that's what good. was being left behind um, that was the case in Seville Deans with a lot of audio pickups and a lot of b-roll and those kinds of things that we got with this in terms of thinking about how how an image could be mapped over three screens um, yeah, maybe I'll play this for a second <laughs> while you're talking um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I haven't actually seen this piece all the way through, but I remember this, like if it was your idea or someone else's, but there was this board, scrap of wood that we found and the task was to get on it, it all together to find a way to get across this little piece of land on this board. Um, 
Do you want to say something about how this piece came together in the install? Are we seeing three, is it a three-sided okay, structure? Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just say really briefly. So what in the installation, uh, the way the work uh, is placed in the gallery is with three screens that kind of create an interior and an exterior. So they're rear projected um, screens where you can sort of see the image from both sides of the screen um, in a kind of like triangular shape with space in between. So you can, oh. and so here you see how, <laughs> there's your name, Carrie. There's my name. <laughs> Uh, so it was shot again with the, with a cast and crew and uh, of of women uh, from Vancouver and to Cary, Los Angeles, um, and the names of everyone uh, who was involved in the project uh, don't appear as credits in the end, but they just sort of appear throughout um, throughout the piece, and um, and so yes, in the gallery you have these three quite large, um, approximately like nine foot by nine foot square um, uh, square rear projection screens. So you never see it like this uh, with three images. You only would ever see kind of two at a time. And you would have the ability to kind of see them in different uh, configurations in relation to each other. And so again, this kind of idea of an inside and an outside and of there being some kind of space uh, uh, movement between those two positions and a lot of sort of in-between space between those two positions. Well, what now? We're at 11.56 in LA and Vancouver. Laura's back. Hi there. <laughs> Shall I stop sharing? Um, sure, yeah, if you're able to, perfect. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you both for, for participating in this field trip and sort of sharing your, your collaborations with, with our audience and with me because it's been such an enlightening and really um, interesting experience listening to you. Um, I haven't seen any questions from the audience, so I think um, if you're comfortable, we can wrap up um, at this point. Um, so thanks again. Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, our next field trip will be on December 1st with artist Howie Choi and Greg Gerard, who's a photographer. Um, so we will be seeing you then, hopefully. Um, thank, thank you, you again. So much. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Carrie.